All right, so now this is an exciting part of the next part of the uh, presentation of the short course. We're going to do a, a hands-on activity um, using JPSS products to access snow and ice conditions for the Iditarod sled dog race. Uh, this is going to be led by Aaron Letterfly. Uh, so Aaron is a young professional hired as a research assistant from the Space Science Engineering Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Aaron's primary research focus is the remote sensing of sea ice and its properties. He's also interested in combining data from multiple sources to generate daily products that supply information about the changing Arctic. Okay, this is going to be an, inter an interactive uh, course here. He's going to uh, go through with us, so let the race begin. <laughs> All right, thanks for the uh, introduction there. And as Christy said, it'll probably be more fun for everyone, oops, if we can go through this together and maybe even have some uh, back and forth throughout the presentation. Uh, so again, thanks for the introduction. Uh, this is going to be a hands-on look at the cryosphere for the 2018 Iditarod sled dog race. And they call this sled dog race the Iditarod. Uh, they refer to it as the last great race on Earth. And um, just this first slide here kind of puts the last great race on Earth in perspective. Um, in 2016, they held the typical starting point uh, racetrack, and they had to actually deliver snow to the premises so that the dogs could mush out of their... Uh, their typical starting point. So, so let that sort of frame this presentation. Keep in mind that uh, the Iditarod race is going to have to change, maybe or else, and uh, we'll go through it together and talk a little bit about some of those changes that are taking place. Um, Jeff Key is a uh, no employee that helped me a ton with uh, some of the content for this presentation, and other material was provided by a lot of my colleagues at SSEC. Yonkin Lee, Yingwei Lu, Rich Dvorak, and then uh, Peter Romanoff actually did a lot of the snow cover stuff. And then just a final attribution here, the Alaska DNR and uh, SSEC Real Earth um, webpage helped me a lot with some of the imagery that I'm going to be using. So in this little interactive exercise, your mission, uh, if you should choose to accept it, um, is as follows. The receding spring snow cover over the last 20 or 30 years has sort of left this sled dog race route in jeopardy. Uh, your goal here is to use a variety of JPSS satellite products to advise this hypothetical Iditarod board of directors on route conditions for the 2018 racetrack and in the years beyond. And in doing that, we're going to, number one, evaluate the 2017 March surface snow cover conditions and determine how the Alaskan snow cover has changed over the last few years. Uh, second, we're going to examine the state of sea ice and frozen rivers along that racetrack route, and we'll try to concentrate or frame things in the context of musher or sort of dog operator safety, as well as the dogs themselves between these checkpoints, because there's some rough terrain out there in Alaska. And then finally, we'll just do a touch on this. We're going to analyze the historic cryospheric conditions for the time of year, which is early March, when this sled dog race, race takes place and we will make our sort of advisement to the board of directors if the deteriorating snow cover necessitates a permanent or just temporary move northward for the 2018 race and beyond. So if you see a portion of a slide that's in italicized bold green type, that's something that I'd prefer that you interact with. And it might be easy if you're sitting near someone to get some cross chatter going and just talk a little bit about what you might think is the answer to some of these questions. Some are easy, some are more drawing a route on your, uh, on your PowerPoint presentation, and some are more open-ended. So we'll get to that. So if you're still lost, or if I haven't explained this Iditarod sled dog race very well, the main ideas are in this first paragraph that um, it's a 1,000 mile long and sometimes slightly longer journey that's pretty grueling. You've got mountain passes, there are frozen rivers, and there's tundra covered in snow, and sometimes not so much snow. Um, the Iditarod sort of gained fame uh, in 1925 when there was a diphtheria outbreak in Nome, Alaska. Uh, there was, I believe, some severely inclement weather, and all of the planes, I think, were grounded, and they, they couldn't fly in this diphtheria medication. So um, you may have seen the Disney movie Balto. That actually uh, sort of 
catalogs or reminisces about um, these sled dogs that went about 700 miles in less than six days to deliver this medicine to this remote town in Alaska. It's a pretty romantic picture, so you get the idea of that. It's a little different today. They, they run this race every year. It's not because anyone is sick. It's because it's more of a, a fun tourist event, and it celebrates the otherwise, I don't know, sort of esoteric culture of rural Alaska where um, in even and odd years, the route actually alternates. So in even years, there's a slightly more northern route that the mushers take. And then in the odd years, there's a more southern route that they take. And so the conditions along these routes are studied, but uh, not necessarily critically analyzed before every race. And so actually in 2015 and in 2017, they had to sort of, in an emergency, uh, about a month before the race, relocate the, the sled dog routes. And so you were no longer on your typical northern or southern route, but they moved it to Fairbanks to, to begin the start. And that's over 300 miles northward of its sort of typical starting point. Um, and the human element, or the sort of commercial element to all this is um, the Alaskan march is, is very dark. There's uh, not a lot of tourism generated during that time of the year. And so these towns that normally host checkpoints along the Iditarod sled dog race they gain a lot from, from the tourist dollars that come in. It keeps their hotels full and their runways and their airports are full of private chartered planes because people want to see this event. And so as climate and surface conditions change, uh, there's, there's been a discussion where some of these northern towns are more excited to host the, uh, the sled dog race because of the economic benefit it could provide, but the southern towns then feel like they're kind of missing out on uh, money that they maybe feel that they deserve historically. So if you would like to just take a minute, uh, sort of acquaint yourself with some sights and sounds maybe of the Iditarod sled dog race. Oh, that's not good. Uh, that's a link that should work. Does it work on anyone's laptop? Okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. That's great. Well, I'll, I'll try to go through it from memory here. Um, <laughs> you should be seeing a couple of images of uh, sled dogs. Are you in presentation mode? I'm in presentation mode, yes. And this is the link? Yeah, that's okay. I, I think I know it's up there. It's not critical that I see okay. it. Uh, you should see the Alaskan Malamute. So there's, there's a number of dogs that run this race, dog breeds at least. You've got the, um, the Alaskan Malamute, which is sort of the, the old faithful. It's built for endurance. It's very husky, or I shouldn't say the word husky because we'll use that more specifically later. Um, but, but that's the tried and true sort of, it can go the nine yards and then get you to the end of the Iditarod race. Um, but the newcomer on the scene is the Siberian Husky. That's a slightly more lean dog. It's faster, and the sort of the serious enthusiasts that want to run the race for time use those dogs. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think what else is on there. I believe there's some schematics of sled dog, or uh, excuse me, of dog sleds. So there's quite a lot of equipment they carry with them on the course. Um, if you combine the weight of all the dogs, the rider, the equipment. It's, I think it's over a thousand pounds, so it's not like you could get out and pull this yourself if for some reason you get hung up. So it's important to keep those dogs healthy. And then I believe in the third row, there's some gifts of Alaskan snow cover from, I think it's like March to July, just to give you an idea of these snow conditions aren't constant. As you go through towards the uh, more well-lit months, some of that snow cover does indeed deteriorate. Uh, and then there's one of, I think, global snow coverage, so you just get an idea of the uh, the rhythm of you know snow and ice is in the northern hemisphere for a year. YouTube. What's that? YouTube. Oh yeah, there's some YouTube videos on there. I'm obviously not going to play them here, but one is sort of a, I think a GoPro perspective of someone doing a, a sled dog mushing thing in Norway, and then I think there's just the JPSS one launch to sort of bring us back into the whole JPSS mindset. Okay, um, so leaving that web page now sounds like someone's playing it good. Um, there's a really good web page on the Iditarod website that shows you all of the checkpoints of every route, and they sort of frame those checkpoints as far as geographically, sort of the cultural and historical significance of that checkpoint along the race. And it's really interesting. If you ever want to do some homework and go through those, you'll see that uh, they put these dog sledders, mushers, I believe is the term, through quite a bit, and uh, it's a very interesting race. I've had a lot of fun learning about it as we go through this. 56 days to go, that's right. So uh, Bill brings up a great point here. The 2018 race hasn't happened yet. So the best we can do is use JPSS products from last year or in, the, in the years prior and base our judgment on how things have changed or how things could look for the year following. Uh, so 
This is our first image we're going to look at. This is sort of uh, from the Alaskan DNR. Uh, this is a, a, a close view of southwestern Alaska. You can see the inset here kind of frames you more in the state of Alaska itself. These are the three routes I was talking about. So these northern and southern routes with the red and yellow arrows, the route alternates between those sort of every other year, okay? And those are uh, the more historical routes. That's what people, if you were to ask an Alaskan, where does the Iditarod take place, they'd, they'd probably tell you there. Um, but in 2015, and then again in 2017, they had this last minute, so I think it was less than 30 days before the race started, decision to move the route to Fairbanks, which is, as you see, much more northward, and um, through a different sort of subset of terrain of Alaska, I think it follows the Yukon River right here. So, um, so they moved it, and does anyone have any idea what could cause this emergency decision to move the route northward 300 miles? Did I hear someone say? Snow cover. Snow cover, wow, great, okay. Absolutely. Um, and to illustrate that, uh, if, if you weren't so understanding that it was snow cover, here's a hint from 2015. This is from the Canadian Meteorological Center. This is a snow depth anomaly from March. And so what this is showing is if you look at the color bar down here, dark blue indicates areas where there are anywhere from 0 to 30 centimeters less snow than normal, uh, snow depth than normal, and then red indicates more snow than normal. So if you could, using your PowerPoint, or sort of maybe just think about it if you don't want to draw along, um, go ahead and try to sketch in the approximate northern and southern routes, or just give a general area where those would be. And then if you were to draw in the Fairbanks route, sort of on that same figure, um, where would that be? So I'll give you guys a moment to sort of just either draw a short line along this image here, or maybe just kind of make a circle or rectangle around the two separate areas that the roots are. So if you're confused or don't know where you are, go back to this slide and maybe look at this inset here and you can see where those routes are. So I'll give everyone just a second to do that. If you want to draw a line, there's an insert menu in the upper left. You can go to shapes, lines, circles, scribble, whatever you like to do. And as you're doing that, um, I think you'll, you'll see it's kind of clear that if you look along this corridor in southwest Alaska, uh, the starting point's over here near Willow. As you get through these mountains that had a little more snow than usual, you see that there's just a, a long stretch of negative snow depth anomaly, meaning that all the snow in that area was much more shallow than normal. There wasn't as much coverage and it wasn't as thick as it should have been, at least historically. But so you move out of the southwestern corridor here, you go back towards Fairbanks you notice that those anomalies are a lot less severe. And if you follow, I don't exactly know where the Yukon River runs, but I have a suspicion that there's even some areas that had more snow than normal. So I believe the idea in 2015 when they moved this northward and then again in 2017 was actually to combat the uh, deteriorating snow conditions in the southern route. So I guess that's one of your options. As we, as we go through this, keep in mind that you could just move the, mountain, the route northward permanently or you could just change a few parts of it. Oh, okay, here. So I've drawn some ellipsoids in where you've got the generally the Fairbanks route here. It's, it's going through some plus or minus zero and maybe even positive snow depth anomalies. And then the southwestern route where those routes have been held all but two years, that had some pretty serious concerns for snow depth that year. It looked like there were sort of large regions where there was almost, you know, half a meter or less of snow than there should have been. And that can be hard on the dogs. Okay, a little bit more about snow, or what kind of snow you can expect along the Iditarod. Um, it snows most of the winter in Alaska, and especially in this part of Alaska. And if the weather is below freezing, you, you have this interesting thing going on where there's a layer of snowpack that forms above the bare ground. So you've got your rocky or your grassy ground, and then you've got snow that's kind of fallen all winter, and it's hardened and frozen into a much more dense sort of substrate below the fresh snow. And you can see this figure on the left here. Maybe, yes. You can see on this figure on the left that it kind of forms layers, all right? And so this is, this is hopefully a softball question. If, if you look at these two figures down on the bottom right, which of them panels shows a fresh bit of snow compared to an old bit of snow? Any, any ideas? Okay, I'm seeing some fingers pointing. It's, it's the picture on the left is absolutely a fresh snowflake crystal, and the one on the right is sort of a they call it drifted snow, settled snow. Mostly it means it's been there a long time. So what happens is 
the snow falls and it's got this crystalline defined shape and it falls on the ground and then over time you have these changes in temperature and humidity that sort of allow these edges to melt and refreeze and it becomes something a lot more ugly and a lot more dense and it looks like this. And um, interestingly enough, this denser settled snow is, is much harder on like dog paws. So if you're mushing 1,000 miles, you'd really prefer the fresh snow or uh, you're going to have to find some new dogs halfway through and that, that wouldn't be very good or probable. Uh, so as you're mushing and you're taking your, your team of dogs across the uh, Alaskan tundra, you're going to need about six inches or 15 and a half centimeters of fresh snow. Uh, th those are the ideal conditions. You're not going to get that everywhere, but if you were planning the dream route, you would find the freshest 15 centimeters of snow and you'd mush all the way across that from uh, Fairbanks to Nome. Um, in the mountains, which is something you're going to encounter in Alaska, there there can be rocks, there can be scree slopes, so some adverse conditions for traction and the uh, website I found said that recommended three feet of snow uh, is required for the mountains. So that's, that's 91 centimeters. Uh, good luck finding that consistently, I, I would guess. Okay, so we've talked about sort of the conditions that you can expect or you can are going to proceed through in, in this exercise. And now the first step is you, you've got this, this goal to, to um, determine where the Iditarod is going to be next year. So take just a moment or two and sort of think about and then maybe list the types of data or the types of data products that would be useful to you in determining the conditions in the Iditarod race route. And you could have anything. This is sort of a pie in the sky here. And um, so take a look at these uh, the routes over on the right. You've got the southern route in orange and the Fairbanks route in blue. And they, they meet up and finish in Nome every year in the same place where that red circle starts. But think about the kind of terrain they're crossing or maybe if they cross over some ocean. And if you're really stumped, go ahead and look at the next two pages. And those are some JPSS products that are currently operational or in research operation mode that, uh, that we'll be using throughout this. So just go ahead and jot down a few or if, if somebody wants to blurt out something they really think would be great in analyzing these conditions, go ahead and do it. So I'll give you guys a moment or so for that. And I'll keep my, uh, my slide presentation here on the uh, data products. Aaron? Yes? Uh, so uh, maybe if I uh, miss this, but how much notice do they need to find out? You know, I guess a month is enough. Uh, we're going to be looking at conditions for the first week of March, so almost like T minus seven days to the race. So assume this is last minute. Assume everything you're seeing is up to date. So um, I hope that answers your question. Okay. So I hope someone has something written down at this point. Does anybody have one they want to blurt out? Current snow cover. Current snow cover, that's great. You know, getting back to what Mitch said in the introduction, mm -hmm. that the polar order data improves model forecasts. Yes. And this gets to the comment there. Part of the challenge here is that you have to make your decision because of logistical right. follow through way beyond the time of good numerical modeling. So what we really need is the perfect 30-day deterministic model that can tell you, because what if you decide to the race of Fairbanks because Anchorage is bare ground? Right. And then two days before the race starts, wham, well, they get three feet of snow. I think that's even happened before. So, yeah. right. So, so yes. I'm going to remind folks to come up to the microphone while we're uh, taping so we can hear you. Thank All right. You. Yeah, of course. So. Surely some snow cover, a really nice deterministic model would, would be ideal. Um, if, if you're just using some of these products, say you had the last 10 years of data and you want to be really safe and say, we're going to look how it's changed and then we'll, we'll make a guess of how it could look this year. Uh, so what we're going to use in this activity from uh, SUMI NPP is going to be the VIRS binary and fractional snow cover. We're going to use sea ice, on, sea ice concentration. Uh, a brief bit of the vegetation index, uh, some composite imagery from the couple of M-bands there, and then we're going to look at sea ice thickness, and that's all from one sensor. And then from AMSR2, which is aboard GCOM W1, we're going to use the AMSR2 snow depth, and we're going to use the AMSR2 sea ice concentration. So I, I hope these products sound reasonable if you were assessing a, a snowy and icy sled dog race. Okay, so the first thing we're going to look at um, is Veer's snow cover. What, what you're seeing here in this image is 
the average snow cover for the first week of March. This is the average snow cover from 2015 to 2017, so the last three or so years. And what we're going to have you do is assume or imagine that the average snow cover that you're seeing here for the first week of March is how it actually looks in 2018. So you're now in the future, you're forecasting for this race, you see this as your snow cover. Okay, so a really light, almost white pixel is going to be fully covered in snow. 100% of that, of that image or that viewing area seen is, is totally covered. And then dark brown is bare ground. Very dark blue is uh, low snow cover. So what I've done here is given you the sort of starting and ending points. Um, this is Willow, Alaska on the right and then Nome on the left. And so what we're going to have you try to do here is draw in the uh, Iditarod Southern Route. So that's going to be kind of a challenge if, if you're not familiar with this. So maybe go back to slide 11 or 12 to look at that route and, and I'll give you a minute to do that. So starting at that right um, star and then moving to the left. It, it could even be a straight line if, if you're not so inclined to follow the geography, but uh, you're definitely going to have to traverse some, some snow cover there and, and some lack of snow cover. You're going to go through different types of terrain, mountains, river valleys, dense forests, probably some, some open fields. Um, and I guess I'll just ask, because whether or not you draw this line, you're definitely going to be seeing it. Would this route probably pass through any bare areas? Uh, is there anything that's brown? Okay, I'm seeing some nods. I, I agree, there's definitely some non-snow cover. So climatologically in the last three years, if you can call it that, there's been areas that have no snow cover. And then there are also, as the next question asks, areas that are totally covered in snow all the time during this first week of March. So I've lightened this image up a little bit and I've drawn the route in myself as best as I could. Um, and now, so I guess you're looking at the route now and you're seeing, yes, there are, there are there's a multitude of, of snow covering along this route. Um, and my next question is, I guess I didn't note it on this map, but the Yukon River runs through here. And sort of along with the Yukon River comes dense vegetation, a river valley, a floodplain. And from what I see, it looks like there's some areas of low snow cover that kind of follow it, going along sort of out into the Yukon River Valley Delta here. Um, my question is, does it look like this low snow cover might just be following a geographical feature, or is this an artifact, or maybe um, is this really how the snow looks? Is it always low in these areas? That's, that's hard to determine. Oh, go ahead. If you overlay a digital elevation model on this one, mm -hmm. so I mean, some people may not be knowing the geography of these things. Or right. If, if some person comes, okay, I want to draw it, but what it is is if you have the digital elevation model and topography or something of yeah. that nature, that definitely helps people to uh, make sure where they are going, whether they are going through ridges or troughs or something of that nature. I agree. To, to know whether you're going through a mountain pass covered in snow or maybe a, a lowland river or something like that is, would definitely be helpful to throw on this image. I'll add a comment to that too. And I'm Eric Stevens I, at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks. So we favor moving to a Fairbanks route of course. for economic purposes. And, and building on your comment there, the history of the Iditarod, as I understand it, is it, the dots connect a lot of uh, the villages. Very so the small. mushers go from village yes. to village. Well, guess where the villages are? They tend to be on the rivers, right. which is low elevation, so mm -hmm. that can affect snowfall. And, and actually, that gets to a broader data problem in Alaska, is that if you look on a horizontal map and where are the ob sites, you'd say, oh, there's a lot of obs sprinkled around. Maybe not a lot, but they're almost all low elevation sites, so you don't get as much data like for snow depth that you would want for some of those the higher terrain that might be more favorable from a snow depth point of view, but you just don't have the data. And then, without a village to stay in and sleep in overnight, logistically, how do the mushers do that? Because the, the villages are the, the pit stops. Right, the Out, outposts, if they're even villages at all, I think sometimes they're very remote uh, from my understanding. Oh yeah. Yeah, uh, so, so we'll get to snow depth uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And there, there is definitely a bias for these measurements that are at least observed to be close to areas of human establishment. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. 
And I'm, I'm sorry, Aaron, I don't mean to take over no, your that's, talk. That's it's fine. hard for me not to just <laughs> Alaskify. I should mention just looking on the, the Anchorage Weather Service website just this morning now, they started January 1st with a snow depth on the ground in Anchorage, which is near the yellow star there of mm -hmm. Willow, two, de two inches on the ground on January 1st. Um, they have since uh, grown that to five, but that's not a lot of snow on, on ground. So right. we'll, still the Iditarod's a while away in time, things can change. Fingers crossed, right? Yeah. <laughs> so this is, this is a little comparison here. Uh, mov moving on, not from snow cover, but uh, it's, it's important to keep these things in mind. This snow cover is, is, not, is a measurement um, from, a, from a signal on a sensor, and it, there might be some uncertainty in this. So what I've got here shown on the left is the Veer's green vegetation fraction. Uh, this is for middle of July, so imagine, uh, or I guess it's, it's late June that I did this. Um, any dark green is going to be an area of like very dense forest. There's going to be a lot of shrubbery, a lot of tree canopies, and so these trees last into the winter. They don't necessarily hold all of their leaves. They're, they're conifers. So they still absorb a lot of that snowfall. But you have to imagine if the snow is falling over a heavily wooded area or, or, or dense, dense vegetation of any sort, some of that snow is going to get caught up in the vegetation and the canopies and what have you. So some of these um, sensors that are actually looking at snow-covered ground may be seeing snow-covered canopy but that doesn't necessarily translate to snow covered ground. So that could be a reason that you're seeing some areas of low snow cover from, from this uh, satellite remotely sensed product. And um, it's, it's just important to know the uncertainty in measurements and then the reasons for that uncertainty. Rather you're, whether you're, rather you're looking at a, um, a satellite product or really any kind of product at all. So moving on, great segue by Eric there into snow depth. Um, what we're looking at here is from AMSR2. This is the average snow depth in the first week of March from 2017. Um, and you can see there that there's quite a range. It's, it's as we said, there's not 80 centimeters of snow over Alaska blanketed. As it, can, it can change day to day very quickly, but then also um, sometimes there's just not that much snow that's fallen in, in, over the winter. And so if we assume that the 2018 snow for, for the upcoming race looks a little bit like this, um, it, it would help us in, in our analysis and, and to make a guidance uh, for this board of directors. So does anyone notice, just sort of looking broadly at this image, are there any sort of shortcomings in the spatial pattern of the snow depth data? Uh, for example, there's anywhere that's gray is not 100% snow covered, obviously. It is an area of no retrieval. So um, to me, it looks like there's a problem with, with adequate snow depth coverage um, in things like heavily vegetated river valleys and coastal pixels. You see along here that anything along the coast doesn't actually give you a, a true snow depth measurement. And it's important to remember that Nome, our finish line out over here, is along the coast. So that last 100 or 150 miles of, of a Iditarod race will not be, you, you can't get a realistic or true measurement for snow cover because it's, they're all coastal pixels. Um, so also things like lake ice and, and river ice sort of obstruct the, the easy understanding and interpretation of snow depth. So we're back to drawing lines again. Uh, you're going to look at the snow sort of along the track of the race routes for early March. Uh, do what you can. Uh, there's, there's three stars here now. So this top star is, is close to, to Fairbanks. So you'll want to draw a line from Fairbanks to the uh, Nome route, and then that's the first thing you'll do and the second one is kind of do your best to draw a line or just interpret as you go from uh, Willow here to Fairbanks and in, in the typical southern route and um, again see slide 11 or 12 if, if you really are stumped on where to put those lines but you're, you're getting to the point now I've had you do this a few times so you might be good at drawing the lines by now I'll let everybody do that for just a second I should mention while you're doing that these these red dots are, are not an accident that's uh, any, any snow depth retrieval on average that's below 20 centimeters I made red because that's getting close to your threshold of these, these sled dogs are, are not able to safely pull their, their gear through that depth of snow. So we want to keep in mind that red is bad in this, in this situation. So you've probably drawn those lines in by now or, or you've got something that resembles this. And so what we've got here is the southern route in this sort of goldish color and then the Fairbanks route in, in light green. And if you could sort of just take a minute, do, do some of your own analysis. Um, 
go through that northern route, just kind of follow it with your fingers, what I do, and get an idea in your head of what is the average snow depth or what's the highest and the lowest snow depth that you're going through as you follow that route. And then do the same for the southern route. And after you've done that, kind of ask yourself, am I seeing similar snow depths, whether or not I go north or south along these routes? Or does one have a, a sort of much higher propensity for deep snow than the other? Um, so go ahead and think about that. And if it's too hard to follow these routes, I understand the colors are kind of hard to see here. Just, just go to the next slide, and it's, it's got a much closer picture of, of these two routes from Willow and then from Fairbanks. Should mention, well, we've talked about this a bit. These black lines are actually rivers. There's a, a lot of rivers in Alaska, and then importantly, you've got the Yukon right here. Um, and it's interesting to me that probably about 50% of this Yukon River, the, the pixels over this uh, don't give you an accurate snow depth retrieval. They give you no retrieval at all. So um, keep that in mind that even if you were to go a long track and sample every bit of snow depth along this uh, southern route, you'd, you'd be missing a few measurements. So uh, your average or your, your sort of mean snow depth might be subject to some, uh, some waffling back and forth there. Um, so which track, does anyone have a guess or, or maybe a, an estimation, seems to go through more patches of the, uh, of the snow limit of the 20 centimeters or less? Does it look like there's more of these red dots close to the northern route or more close to the southern route? Anybody? Or are they about equal? I mean, I think they're about equal, if, if anyone wants to agree with me there. There's, there's not a huge patch of of dark red that either of them are going through. There's some scattered areas, but, but nothing that is consistently below 20 centimeters. And that's a good thing. If, if you wanted to really unpack some of this, this snow depth product, you can, you can go along the track and sample every kilometer, and you, you get something like a histogram. The histogram looks like this. If you, if you plot every snow depth and stack it in the same bin uh, along the uh, northern route on the left and then the southern route on the right, excuse me, Fairbanks route on the left, you see that um, our mean snow depths are within two centimeters of each other. And not only are they close, they're both 15 centimeters above uh, your limit. So you're in the clear as far as uh, snow depth goes. Um, but you, you may notice that there's quite the spread of snow depths along that southern route. You've, you've got a few areas that are getting close to your threshold where it's not safe for the dogs to be mushing anymore. And you've got a few areas that are you know, 45 centimeters deep, that's, that's, that's plenty of snow. Um, the Fairbanks route, that northern Alaskan route, is, is a little more consistent, possibly because you're just going horizontally, um, sort of at a similar line of latitude along that Yukon River. For much of it, you're getting a consistent, uh, a little more uniform distribution of, of snow cover there. Uh, but in general, these long track snow depths are similar. And so there, there doesn't seem to be a, a huge, at least in 2017's data view, um, advantage to moving it northward, at least in this back half of the route. We've talked plenty about snow, and it's time to switch gears to my personal favorite, which is uh, looking at the sea ice concentration. Um, and then this is sort of another general question for everybody, just ignoring lunch for one second. Uh, looking at the Veer's sea ice concentration, as you go from offshore, very far offshore, even ocean, to closer to shore in southwestern Alaska, can anyone say what generally happens to the sea ice concentration? I uh, should mention sea ice concentration is the amount of ice that is in a, a viewable region. So 100% means totally ice covered, 0% means totally open water, and 50 would be half and half. So what happens to that ice cover and ice concentration as you get closer to the shore in, in a lot of parts of this uh, southern part of Alaska? Anybody? Gets less. It gets thinner. It gets... Um, you, there's more uncertainty as to whether or not uh, you're, you're walking or you're mushing over full ice coverage. It's, it's, there's a little bit of, there's something suspect in there. It's, uh, there's, there's portions of open water, or at least you can say that this pixel is 60% ice. We don't exactly know where, but we know 40% of it is water. So keep that in mind as we go through these next few slides here. Um, I've got your route drawn on for you this time, uh, so there's not a lot of uh, landmarks in this white image to go by. So this is a closer view of southwest Alaska, and this is the southern route. So this is the route they take every year uh, unless they have to move it northward, or excuse me, every other year. But, but this is consistently in the part of Alaska they're going through. 
And it's kind of hard to see, but follow this blue line. This, this is a somewhat easy question. Do they or do they not go over water? Um, it looks like at a first glance they kind of skirt the land, but um, I think geometry dictates that the quickest way between any two points is a straight line. And I think it's um, Koyuk and Shuktulik are these two towns on either side of Norton Sound. So the, what should I say, the, the racer that wants to win is going to go over the top of that bay and there's going to be some ice. So the answer to that one is yes, they, they absolutely do go over ice, sea ice and open water and we're going to look more into that. So we've zoomed in quite a bit. Uh, this region that's circled, I'm going to zoom in really far on that. You kind of lose context of the surrounding geography when you zoom in that close, but here we are. I've got a couple things labeled here. This is Shuktulik, which is one of the checkpoints along the Iditarod. And this is Koyuk, which is the next checkpoint. And this is Norton Bay. So what I've done is I've overlaid the sea ice concentration uh, onto this image here. And when you look at this somewhat up close view, can anyone give me sort of the low point of concentration between the two checkpoints of Shaktulik here and Koyuk there. What's, what's the lowest that sea ice concentration gets along this green line? How low does it go, I guess is what they say. About 60. About 60? Okay. 50. 50. All right. Well, it, is it yeah, so maybe there's some open water along the coastline. Um, in any case, we, all, we probably all agree it's not 100%. You're, you can't keep your eyes closed and just mush across the ice, and you're, you're not going to have a good time if you do that. Because uh, keep in mind, if the ice concentration is 60%, that's sort of like saying the open water concentration is 40%. So it's probably dark. It's probably windy. It's maybe snowing. I would not personally want to mush my dogs across 40% open water. Uh, and only 60% ice. So um, that's something to keep in mind. It's, it's doubtful that you would change the route completely from Shuktulik to Koyuk, but it is possible that you could give an advisory and say, hey, we've, we've got a, a pretty significant region of, of low ice concentration coming into that bay, and where there's low ice concentration, that's, that's actually room for um, the offshore ice or the, or the, the brash ice to, to move around and, and move out further. So. Where there's open water, there will probably be more open water if, if it's getting more towards the summer. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we don't just have to use veers when we're looking at sea ice concentration. AMSER 2 also has a sea ice concentration. And if you look at this sort of uh, dotted circle here, I tried to put them around the similar place. They're in a slightly different geographical projection on this, but you, you can make do, I believe. Um, the two sea ice concentration color bars are, are different. Um, but there are some similarities and some, and some differences. Um, generally, you see the, the same pattern where as you get closer to shore in southwest Alaska, you definitely see decreased sea ice concentration. And furthermore, you see that there's this sort of, um, uh, what am I trying to say? There's, 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 a large, there's a small area of open water and then definitely an area of reduced sea ice concentration right here in the Norton Sound. Um, let me mouse over that. Um, so there, there are obvious similarities between these two sea ice concentration products. That's great. Um, when you have two products, you might as well look at them both and arrive at a consensus, uh, all other things held equal. Um, but, but they agree here in this case, I would say. There's uh, an area of reduced sea ice concentration pretty much smack dab in the middle of your uh, checkpoints in the sled dog race. Um, the, the small reason for the difference is if, if you say, well, this one looks a little more ugly, a little more grainy, that's because I believe the nominal resolution of this one is 6.25 kilometers, and this one is closer to 750 meters. So you're almost dealing with an order of magnitude difference, but they, but the, they still give a, an agreement, which is nice. Okay, so we've talked a bit about sea ice concentration and snow cover and snow depth, and there's this other quantity, which is really pretty important when you think about it, uh, sea ice thickness. That's, that's obviously going to be important if you're going over ice, which we established that you are. Um, there there's, can be quite a range of sea ice thicknesses in the Arctic, anywhere from uh, you know, zero to up to, I think, two to three meters north of the Canadian archipelago. Um, but in, in many cases, it's sort of a very gradual transition from thin to thick sea ice, but not everywhere. So if anyone can look in this Norton Bay area, which I've, I've got noted here, it's, it's definitely green. What color of green is up to debate, 
but um, I would say it's somewhere between 1.4 and 2.0 meters of uh, sea ice thickness. And the Ontario Snowmobile Safety Committee has provided us with this graphic here uh, that shows the sort of depth of, sea, or the thickness of sea ice versus the type of vehicle that you can drive over it safely. So if we have two meters of sea ice thickness, do you guys think we'd be able to get a thousand pound sled dog team over it safely? <laughs> Yeah, probably. I mean, you can, you can drive, you've seen ice road truckers, I mean, they drive 16 wheelers over less. So if there's ice, it's probably thick enough for you to be safe and take your dogs over. So assuming you've got the right ice concentration, you at least don't have to worry about falling through it, okay? So your sled dog teams are safe, at least in that respect. Our last thing we're going to look at here, well, our last real JPSS operational product is this is uh, some M-band imagery. It's, it's from a number of different bands. And the nice thing about imagery is it kind of can tie everything together. You're, you're seeing something that, it, that is physically there. It's, it's not just a measurement or a brightness temperature. You can, you can look at this and sort of get a human assessment of, of what you're seeing. Um, so there, obviously, if, let me orient you guys. This is Nome here. North-south axis is kind of along this line, I believe. And so you might have to tilt your head a little bit to, to understand. This is the Seward Peninsula, which we've kept looking at. And here's Nome. Take a second and write down or jot down or just even think about what are some things you see? What jumps out at you? Uh, as, as you look at this imagery, it's a little different. You're not getting a continuous depth field. You're not necessarily seeing a ice thickness, but you're kind of seeing all of those things sort of coming together. So what, what is something that someone sees? And anything. It can be obvious or, or not obvious. All right, there's, there's some shoreline ice and maybe even some open water along the uh, Norton Sound there. Hey, Aaron, do you, what bands are in this, this is, RGB? I think it's M5, M7, and, uh, you know, I really should know. It's, it's in my slide notes if you've got the presentation okay. pulled open, I believe. Um, I, I think there are three. I should have known that off the top of my head, though, excuse me. Anyone finding it in their notes? M10, okay, so 5, 7, 10, something like that. Uh, so th those are the bands that are featured here. Um, I got this from a colleague, so um, I was very appreciative but didn't ask a lot of questions when I, when I received this image. Um, but it's, it's fairly easy to see, uh, as Bill pointed out, there's an open water pattern right here in Norton Bay. And if we remember, the, the checkpoints actually go more like this over the sound, but if there's open water here, that means that there could be open water near it. I, there's a propensity for open water to inspire more leads and more cracks and changes in the sea ice surrounding it. So that's something that if you're just, if you're gonna look at one product and it's this imagery, you'd say, well, there's some open water there. And then going along Koyuk all the way coastline to Nome, there's maybe even other parts of open water. So stay along the shoreline. Another thing you might see is um, some snow cover here. Now, I don't know the exact pronunciation of this. I believe it's the Nulato Hills. This is um, a fairly mountainous region. I mean, there, there'd be mountains in many states, maybe not in Alaska, um, but you pretty much have to traverse these if, if, you're, if you're sledding uh, or mushing from Willow uh, over to some of the points over here. Kaltag, I believe, is the, the hookup point where you start to go along the coastline. But you've got to go over these mountains, and they need to be covered in snow. Otherwise, you're not going to have very much fun with your thousand pounds of gear and dogs going over it. So you do see there's, there's just a little sprinkling of snow cover. Now, we'd have to cross-check with the depth to hope that that's above 15 centimeters or maybe even closer to, I believe it was 90 centimeters that you need for safe travel. But you can still see that snow cover is there. So that's a, that's a hopeful thing to see, uh, but it bears further inspection. And then finally, um, you can see the Yukon River in the, in the bottom of this image, sort of on this slant here. Um, but what you can't see is its conditions. Now, you might say, well, it looks light, so maybe there's snow on the top, meaning that if it's covered in snow, it's probably got a layer of ice over it. Um, this is March in Alaska, so the rivers are mostly, if not all, frozen. Uh, so it is probably covered in ice, but that's something that uh, bears further inspection as well, because, um, as Eric said, a lot of these checkpoints are along the river valley and, and actually right on the Yukon. They're crossing over other little rivers uh, of, of numerous names, but 
you're pretty much following river valley the whole way through. So knowing river conditions or something like that could be super helpful for something like this. Well, that's great because there's a sort of still slightly experimental product, the JPSS River Flood product, and they have an Alaska region specific product. So if you were to go to something like SSEC's Real Earth Portal, uh, you can actually do the drop down menu on the side there and select that product to be an overlay uh, as far as what you're looking at in Alaska. And you can see that, well, this is the Yukon River right here. Um, this is actually pretty close to our region. Um, this is the, the Norton Sound right here. And so you may not be crossing this exact section, but you'd be crossing the Yukon at some point. And it shows you that there is um, definitely ice where there's not cloud. So that's, that's a, just another thing to note about this product. You can't have too much cloud cover or uh, you can't really get a good estimate of how much ice is on the rivers. Um, but this is pretty much in real time and it's, it's archived as well. So you can go back a few weeks or months and look at historic river conditions. Uh, so come March, 56 days, I believe still, um, go ahead and look at the Yukon River conditions and see if they're going to be able to cross safely. They probably will be. Okay, so I've given you a lot of products to look at and a lot of sort of small questions to think about. And now it's almost time to make your decision. So using kind of what you saw, if, if you can maybe write down somewhere or just type in here uh, one or two sentence, super short paragraph analysis of the presented conditions, I say for 2018, but really take into account what we looked at and assume that's how it's going to look. Um, do the conditions that you saw indicate sort of safe passage through all the checkpoints? Are, are there a few checkpoints that are maybe a little more suspect? There's some elements of danger or just some uncertainty that you should consider as you're making your decision. Um, and if you make a decision, if you really say one way or the other, we should move this, why or why not should you move that? Um, and if you need to break this down further, I figure out that it helps to kind of ask it in a couple parts. Does the southern route or the, the typical route that they would be running this year, does it have acceptable snow fraction totals along the entire route? Basically, are we running through bare ground for any super long stretches of the race? Um, if that's easy enough to ask, well, okay, you've got snow, but how deep is it? Does the average snow depth along this route stay above 15 centimeters? Um, <laughs> snow is great, but a dusting of it isn't going to do much if you've got a thousand pounds of gear. Um, and once you're done with the sort of snowy first part of the race, you've got to go over that sea ice. So do sea ice conditions, at least for 2017, do they pose a significant risk? I mean, as sort of ice totals recede near the poles, Maybe you will encounter a time where your, um, your sled dog team needs to have like some flotation devices on it or something like that. And then finally, if, if you're going to change up this route in general, how could you do it as sort of in the least invasive way possible? If, if you're going to move the southern route or you're going to move it all the way to the north, maybe keep parts of it, what's the best way to incorporate that change? So I'll let you guys think about that for a moment. Um, just, just sort of collect your thoughts. I believe in the slide notes, I can't see them on here, but it tells you sort of slides that go along with each of these questions and how to maybe answer them effectively and somewhat quickly if, if, you're, if you're stuck or you don't quite remember what each product looked like. We have activated the Slido polling options for three of those four questions, so you can log on and submit your answer there as well. Thanks, Jordan. That's, that's a really interactive and effective way to ask these. <laughs> I see people are scrolling and looking, so I think that's good. Or you're checking your emails, but that's fine too. All right, surely you were able to get an answer together in 30 seconds. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pretend that you did. Um, how about this? I'm going to ask people to raise their hands, and that way we don't have to go through any long-form explanation. We can, we can bring the slide out. Oh, let's do that then. <laughs> okay. That's, that's fine. It's 
Oh, odd. Well. Okay, he's going to check it. Yeah. Oh boy. There we go. So, I guess let's we'll just Um, I'll maybe just read them off. Sure, that sounds great. All right. Uh, so does the southern route have acceptable snow fraction totals along the entire route? The no votes were 80%. The yes uh, votes were 20%. Okay. Do sea ice conditions toward the end of the route pose a significant risk? Yes votes were 60%. No votes were 40%. Whoa. And does the average snow depth stay above 15 centimeters mark along the entire route? Yes votes were 20%, no votes were 80%. All right, so it sounds like a lot of you guys found the southern route unacceptable uh, for one reason or another, be it uh, snow depth or snow cover or something like that. So it sounds like you're in favor of Maybe changing a few things, perhaps not all of it, but definitely changing a few checkpoints along that, along that typical route, which is interesting because um, now you can fill this out in your own time. This is a, a forward dated excerpt from the Alaskan Times, which I made that name up. It's probably not a real newspaper, but um, due to your you know, careful planning and insight, you were able to determine that the remotely sensed some sort of product was extremely helpful, allowing potential hazardous, say, sea ice features to be pointed out near Koyuk uh, along the Seward Peninsula. And the economic centers along the, sounds like you guys wanted it to be the northern route or the Fairbanks route, uh, were delighted to host the race again in 2019. So uh, that's all I've got. Thanks a ton, you guys, for playing along, I guess you could say. And it was a lot of fun learning about this. And I hope you got something out of it. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. That was wonderful.